thanks for coming. My name is Tim Vermeulen. I'm assistant professor here in cultural studies at the Department of Cultural Studies. And this is My name is Raso Mutra. I'm also an assistant professor at uh, the Cultural Studies Department. A colleague of Tim. We teach many courses together. Uh, and we are happy, we are very happy to uh, uh, host this evening tonight called Resurfacing Software. Yeah, we're here playing second fiddle tonight. We're here to moderate an evening that has been put together by our brilliant honor students, uh, Maranke Wieringa, who's sitting here, and Michel Ottens, who is Lasso's student, and who will start the evening in a few seconds. Uh, and they've invited some fantastic speakers with whom we want to begin imagining the relationships between digitality, between narratives, between aesthetics and games, between aesthetics and surfaces, between the different facets that are occupying, that are making our society today. We're we going to have five talks uh, that seem to be very diverse. And by the end uh, of this evening, we're going to have a panel discussion that will try to bring uh, all these different ideas together. Yeah. We we'll start with Michel Ottens, then we'll have a lecture by Dr. René Vlas from the University of Utrecht, then Maranke Wieringa will speak, then Michel Bertens um, um, from the Vague V2 and many different projects, and finally marie Law Ryan, who has come all the way from the US to, to join us here today. Uh, please save your questions uh, to the very end. We're going to have these presentations in our own in the panel discussion. Uh, you'll have the chance to, uh, uh, to engage in the discussion and ask questions. And in closing, we would like to thank very much uh, the Honors Academy at Radboud University, the faculty, uh, and also the Department of Cultural Studies uh, for helping us uh, organize this event. Our first uh, speaker tonight, this evening, this very light evening, is uh, Michel Tens, uh, my student. Um, and the title of his talk is The Appearance of Interfaces. The floor is yours, Michel. The title of my talk is Film of Computer Games. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, that's my own custom. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it's great to be here in front of you. Uh, I hope to be able to watch your interest as I present some of the findings from my two year research project on the apparent influences uh, of our established understanding of film on the creation and interpretation of artifacts from the relatively young and unfamiliar medium of computer games. Uh, I'll first go into the theoretical basis for my project. Uh, we'll then illustrate this theory and my findings with a series of brief case studies. Spoiler alert, uh, I found that many familiar properties of the film medium are used in the depiction of what happens in computer games. Uh, and where these cinematographic means obviously fall short, some unique properties of computer games come to the fore. I wanted to add to a basic media literacy with this project to develop notions for a general and unspecialized audience uh, of what computer games do to players and what they tell them. Uh, so I'm keeping to simple notions. I then decided to build on Marshall McLuhan's intuition that the contents of new media comprise the forms of older media, uh, what Bolter and Grusin uh, developed as their concept of remediation. How we've probably, probably been using what's familiar to us from older popular media like film, music, architecture and literature when we set about creating and interpreting these relatively new and unfamiliar computer games. Uh, I'm looking to increase our, uh, in looking to increase our understanding of computer games, I think our knowledge of how other media work is a good point of departure. The most popular forms of uh, popular types of computer games have been using moving images projected from a rectangular screen for decades now uh, in the style of film to depict their processes at play. Uh, so I decided to examine that first, this remediation of film properties in computer games, but also the ways in which film cannot fully recount what games do. To do this, I modified Mary Lorraine's concepts uh, for how a story might relate to the medium with which it is told. For a list of film properties, I would look at how these properties were either used unchanged in computer games, were either uh, were explicitly neglected or adapted to suit the medium of computer games. I wanted to speak to an entry-level understanding, uh, so I looked for theoretically grounded and well-understood properties uh, of film, taken from introductory works on film studies, 
Uh, theorists such as Bartholomew and Thompson, uh, Barson, Monahan, and Gutzig, uh, Gibbs, Orpen, etc. I think I'm running out of time. Um, to organize these as a cohesive and comprehensive whole, uh, I arranged the properties I found useful according to a phenomenological understanding of film. Building on aesthetics theories uh, by Merleau Ponty and Timothy Morton, among others. Uh, I arranged them according to my understanding of how a film appears to us gradually. Emerging against the background um, uh, in the form of a film screen on which moving pictures appear at a certain rate with editing and cuts um, uh, separating or combining these images. These images of things arranged across a flat screen or things within an illusionary three-dimensional space. These images depict the choreography of things moving together. I wanted to avoid discussions of meaning and interpretation as much as possible, so I excluded narrative from this list. I also wanted to focus on film specifically, so I left out uh, stuff like soundtrack and cinema theater architecture as well. So I took this arrangement uh, of well-understood film properties, uh, and for each I described my experiences with games that showed the unchanged use of that property, and games that explicitly disused it, and games that adapted that property to suit the medium of computer games. This led to 18 extensive case studies that demonstrated the influence of film on computer games, and which also hinted at the uniqueness of this new medium. New medium. Now on to some of my findings. The first of these film properties, the film screen. Uh, the flat rectangular screen uh, onto which moving images are projected. Uh, it's the deepest background that we still consider to be a part of a film artifact. Uh, the thing furthest back that still grabs our attention, uh, uh, grabs and directs our attention and which holds our gaze. Uh, I'll go through my case studies for this property in detail and then speed through the others that I did. The computer game, Heavy Rain, conditions its player to sit back and gaze complacently at events unfolding. Repeatedly, the player is given no control over what happens as they're made to just stare uh, while the camera frame moves around and uh, actors act and scenes change. However, the player is also repeatedly jolted out of this complacent uh, mode of viewing whenever they unceremoniously gain or regain control over the game's events. In the scene shown here, uh, I don't know if it's clearly visible for everyone. Um, in the scene shown here, uh, the character that the player will control is about to wake up, uh, but still asleep in the top two images. Uh, as the guy wakes up, the player has to gaze at an automated film sequence for a while yet, as they would passively gaze at a film screen. Then when this character becomes conscious, uh, conscious uh, the game suddenly prompts the player to act in the bottom two images. While nothing obviously changes in the use of camera movement or editing, or in the detail and fidelity of what's visible. Heavy Rain takes our conventional mode of engaging with a film screen and contrasts it with those moments when a player is called upon to act. This happens the other way around as well, and it also happens as an emphasis to more stressful or dramatic events deeper in the game. I also looked at the explicit disuse of a film screen in the game Half-Life. Uh, these images are probably very unclear. <coughs> uh, near the start of this game, uh, the player is scared repeatedly and made to feel vulnerable when a series of events causes them to go blind for brief moments in between these images of their surroundings here. Uh, and the game denies them the motion picture images they've become dependent on. As the screen goes black here, the player can still hear what's going on and they can apparently still act but those abilities appear useless in the face uh, of these brief moments of blindness. Then there's another code to memories which adapts its screen to the computer game medium. The game uses two screens to show what is happening and the players of this game is often tasked with uh, moving these screens around um, touching them, like in the top left image, uh, or um, repositioning themselves to look at the reflections on the smooth surfaces of, of these screens, like in the bottom right image. 
uh, among other things. These screens are made a part of the game's manipulable, actionable environments, and the player is made to physically explore their affordances. So computer games have used, purposefully neglected and adapted the film screen to narrative and poetic purposes. We all know that film creates the illusion of moving images with a quick succession of static images. The uncontrolled rate at which these images appear in Shadow of the Colossus creates a constant, narratively appropriate dread uh, at these unpredictable losses of control for the game's player as they engage in ever more involved and risky action sequences. The more complex the visual action, the higher the chance is that this game will react slowly or not at all to what the player tells the game to do. Whereas in Pac-Man Championship Edition DX and Bayonetta, a smooth and controlled frame rate uh, with a speed of motion that is also ramped up or slowed down uh, on predictable locations helps a player control the situations they're confronted with. My case studies on the appearance of editing in games all seem to play with the sense in which editing in film represents an outside influence that organizes our view of a sequence of events or a sequence of motion pictures, whether we want it to or not. And all of the case studies on mise-en-scene seem most concerned with communicating to a player visually what they could or couldn't do in a given game's environment, whether by arranging them uh, in a certain way across the flat plane of the screen, or by arranging them within this illusionary volume of space that appears to be behind the screen. Finally, uh, the use, disuse or adaptation of choreography in the games I studied either pushes the player to the sidelines in an ongoing sequence, uh, ongoing dance of actors moving in relation to each other, or the choreography is used to draw the player in, to exaggerate their movements and urge them to act in specific ways as they move alongside other actors in the game. Many popular computer games appear to use the properties of the medium of film unchanged. Many of these also purposefully make no use of a specific property and many have adapted the properties of film as well. And in each of these cases the games clearly play into their audience's expectations from the film form and their prior knowledge of its properties. When a game uses a film property unchanged, as in Heavy Rain's use of the screen and their passive engagement with it, it's often to contrast this with what makes computer games different from film. If a property is explicitly disused, it draws attention to how other elements of the game relate to each other. Just like how Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes draws attention with its disuse of editing to the continuity of its environments and the actors moving in it. And to its transition between automatically directed actions and the player being allowed to act. The entire game is presented as one long moving image without any cutting between shots. When a game adapts the properties of film to suit the medium of games, possibility spaces and affordances for a player to act come to the foreground. Such as in Portal 2, which adapts the mise-en-scene so that every object in the game communicates a sole purpose and a single functionality. For the player. It becomes clear from these many examples that the appearance of film in computer games is generally a way of communicating to the player what a game is about, behind its immediate representations, in familiar and reassuring ways. As of now, this project is still in development and I'm already working on a similar analysis of how the medium of architecture might influence our understanding of games, but I hope to have demonstrated how established knowledge of other media can influence what we see in computer games. Thank you all for listening. Um, I look forward to your questions and comments during the panel discussion later this evening. Uh, let's now give, give the floor to René Klaas for his presentation.
Thank you very much, Michelle, also for giving excellent time. Uh, our second speaker is uh, René Haas, and he's Assistant Professor of Media and Performance Studies at the University of Utrecht, and he focuses on computer game research, uh, new media, and digital culture. And the title of, 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 his, uh, of his talk is On Car Textual Play. Yes, thank you. Somewhat of a mysterious title, maybe. Um, so what my talk is actually about is on the next slide. Which is, um, I will be focusing on what you could call are the making of media of games. There are the uh, behind the scenes documentaries, concept art galleries, audio commentaries, alternate endings, and all, all the other, um, well, making of media which show or provide insight into the creative processes which went into creating a game. And usually these kind of making of media um, are associated with special editions, right? If you think about film, for instance, uh, um, you have the uh, making of documentaries, the extras, on a separate disc when you buy the special edition. So when you, for instance, type in uh, games and special editions, you, you, you get to see these kinds of images on Google. So this is like a, a, a Google search for game special editions. So you see all these nice box sets um, of games, um, which includes you know, character art, little statues, um, art books uh, with photographs of uh, concept art. Uh, there's DVDs there with, uh, with the lengthy uh, making of documentaries. Uh, stickers, t-shirts, and what have you. All kinds of stuff which uh, goes into these special edition box sets. Just to show you that this is not necessarily a new thing, at least not for games. I'm showing an example from my own uh, collection. I didn't bring it actually with me. Um, but this is the, uh, the Director Scott limited edition two disc sets of Rise of the Robots. Is anyone familiar with that particular game? It's a, it's a classic, in, in a sense that it's considered to be one of the worst games ever made, um, from 93, so it's, re it's re really old as well. Um, but, you know, this game was one of the most expensive games uh, made back then, in, uh, in 93, um, so they, the publisher thought it would be nice to have a nice special edition, Director Scott limited edition to this CD set, for this particular game, it's actually a numbered version as well. Um, um, for a long time, I thought I was the only one having actually having this special edition, and then after years and years, some of some other people popped up online and said, you know, I, what I found in my basement is this particular box. But what's interesting about this um, really old special edition of this game from '93 is that all the extras you had to access them um, through DOS because Windows wasn't around yet. Another version from 1996. Star Trek Judgment Rights, uh, a limited edition collector's uh, version, has the, uh, has the specials on a VHS tape within the box, so not even on the disc. Um, the reason why I show you these is just to remind you, or just to show you basically that when it comes to special editions of, of, uh, of digital games, that they actually precede um, DVDs, uh, the popularity is of, of DVDs uh, and DVD extras, which only became a, a, a huge success in the late late 90s, early 2000s, even though the film industry experimented with uh, special editions with films uh, with laser discs already in the 80s. But okay, um, I'm also not really talking about these kinds of special editions because what I'm actually really interested in is these kinds of making of media. So this is a screenshot from um, the Tomb Raider, the recent Tomb Raider game from 2013. I actually finished this game um, and uh, when I did so I um, I looked in into the menu and I saw um, uh, these are characters environments a menu option and I saw that, that I hadn't unlocked the full gallery of concept art yet. So um, you, this is a, a, a version of uh, making of media where, uh, where you do not just get the making of media instantly when you buy the game, but you have to earn them, right? They are, you have to unlock them. And they are also not just, they are also not located outside of the game in the box, 
for instance, but they are within the game software itself. So, to just to formulate some, some main questions for my talk, are these making of media actually part of the main game? Because they seem to be, because you have to unlock them. What then is actually the main game? Is there such a thing as a, a main game when they are so intertwined? And how should we study these making of media of games? What is their role and what is their function in relation to games when we study digital games? Some of you are probably active or want to be active in the field of game studies where these kinds of questions, of course, what is a game, how should we study them, are relevant. So one way of approaching this, and now we are moving to the paratextual part, is by using this term paratext from uh, Gérard Genette from, uh, well, this version from the book from 1997. Um, this, is a, this is from, uh, from literary studies, um, where he basically discusses the difference between text, the book, yeah, the text itself, that's the story, and the paratexts. And the paratexts are those texts which sit between you, between you as a reader, and the main text. For instance, the information on the back flap of the book, or the picture in front of the book, which are thresholds of interpretation as he calls them, they steer the meaning creation uh, and the interpretation of the core text before you actually get to the main text. And as such, should not be ignored. They actually play a major part in meaning creation when you read a book. Think about uh, walking through a bookstore and looking at all the covers of books. You know, some of them might interest you because it have, they have a nice girl on them, or they are green or something, or might have an interesting story uh, 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 on the back, without you actually having read the main text. So, this has been applied, applied outside literary studies as well. For instance, by seeing trailers and other promo material of uh, media as paratextual. This is from an interesting book by Jonathan Gray, which is called Show Sold Separately, where he looks uh, among other things, at uh, DVD extras, for instance, Lord of the Rings uh, DVDs. And what he, s what he sees is that while most of these meat making of media are rather uncritical, um, they usually only depict the success of, of the film and not necessarily the failures during the production, and as such, most of these meat making of media are completely aligned with the, the corporate agenda of actually selling this product. What he also shows uh, uh, quite insightfully in his book is that paratextual frames can prove remarkably important for how they assign value to a text. Situating it as a product, for instance, but also as a work of art. Um, and at the same time, making of media, or these paratexts of media, uh, frame the consumer itself, the, the reader or the viewer, as an insider. Um, and if you watch all the documentaries in these massive extended editions of the Lord of the Rings, Blu-rays or DVDs for instance, you know more than uh, someone who hasn't seen all, those, uh, all that material. And for fans, knowing all the details makes you become one of the insiders into this great work of art, uh, which is the Lord of the Rings um, uh, uh, trilogy. And this is of course how these box sets frame you. As, uh, as an insider. What this book, however, um, does not really do is uh, discuss games in a way that I would like him to have done so, because he considers games, digital games, as paratexts to the main text, which are films. So what he basically does is say, you know, you have uh, at, yeah, you have game adaptations of films and the game adaptations are the paratext to the main text which is the film. However, games themselves are of course also texts and they themselves also have their own paratexts as I've shown you earlier with the special editions. So, for some, some disclaimers then before I continue. Um, and this comes from a nice book, The Meaning of Video Games by uh, Stephen Jones. Um, when it comes to today's popular media, including new media, including also digital games, it is necessary to, of course, treat a print culture construct such as a paratext as a helpful, but inevitably limited, slippery concept. Um, rather than uh, seeing text and paratext as completely separate, there are no, not really discrete texts. It's really unclear where a text ends and where the paratext begins, right? 
Um, so take that into account when you think about text and paratext. I try to as well. Uh, it might be a bit formalist, but uh, at least it makes it helps us to, to think about the relation between, say, a main text and all the material which lies around it, which lives around it. And a, a, well, a second disclaimer, which should be rather obvious when I talk about text and paratext. I'm not you know, conflating text with narrative, right? Games are not necessarily narratives or st about stories. Um, uh, games can generate meet meaning also through their just, their just their ludic dimensions, through their gameplay. They generate meaningful play. Meaning, meaning in games is not only generated by the fact that it has a story. So onwards to what paratextual analysis then will actually be. I'm not actually going to run through this entire list that Jeanette talks about uh, paratext as being as a spatial dimension, a temporal dimension, a substantial dimension, a pragmatic one, and a functional one. And I'm focusing on these two in this talk. So thinking about the spatial dimension of paratexts in relation to the main text or the spatial dimension, the, the location um, of making of media in relation to the game. Um, and also their function, uh, the function that, it that, uh, that the message aims to fulfill. And doing so, I'm backtracking a bit again to film studies where they've been discussing DVD extras not that much, there, there are not met that many film scholars interested and actually have been looking um, uh, at, at extras uh, of films because, as I already said, most of them see them as uninteresting marketing material. Um, but what uh, Hyde has done in uh, 2005 by looking at the Lord of the Rings uh, uh, DVD box set, for instance, is saying that we should not just look at the nature of the content of the documentaries which are on these discs. So if you buy the Lord of the Rings trilogy uh, on Blu-ray, you actually get the, this many discs for those you know, it's a massive amount of documentaries. Does anyone know how many hours there are on there? Yeah? I saw all of them. Yeah, I do. <laughs> 30, 40 hours. Yeah, four, 30 yeah. hours of documentaries and, and, and even more uh, in audio commentaries. Those on for, for, for an endless amount. So what he, is, what, I, what he actually argues is that we should not just look at the, the content of all these documentaries, but the fact that they, they also uh, present us trajectories, which are shaped by the, the disk's software interfaces. Um, so for instance, this is from the booklet of the Lord of the Rings uh, uh, edition, and uh, you go through these extras, not randomly, but through a fixed trajectory, right? Which is created, of course, by the makers which also um, presents a certain way of interpreting the material. Well, in the case of the Lord of Rings trilogy and these uh, extras, these extras are actually on a separate disc, so they're not still separate from the main text, you could argue. But what you can see with games is something different. And this is something I you know, argue in this talk. And the way paratextual material is presented, but also intertwined with the game, both spatially, its location, and functionally, what it does. Uh, it's not just shape potential readings and interpretations of the game, but also potential playings, the way you actually play through the game, and not just create meaning uh, related to the content of the game. And this is what I call paratextual play. So here we have the, the title. Um, and one way of doing that is, is, uh, is seeing these making of media as, uh, as rewards. Something you, um, uh, you have as secondary goals of a game. So the main goal of the game is finishing it, right? Getting to the end of getting high score. The secondary goals might be, as I showed you earlier in the example of Tomb Raider, might actually be unlocking the making of media, uh, having them as rewards in the game. So, some examples of that. Half-Life 2, this is uh, the uh, second expansion, uh, episode 2, actually has audio commentaries, which you have to unlock. And you unlock them basically just by playing through the game. Every time you play through a level and succeed, 
um, you unlock the audio commentary of that level. And it says here, complete the chapter to unlock its commentary. Oh. Um, so um, when I have time later, I will actually may, might even explain how this audio commentary actually works in this game. But I will already click to the next slide. So, then. <laughs> so here we are. Um, another way how games actually do this is that you unlock them, you have to unlock them by actually earning an in-game currency and you have to pay for them within the game. So this is from Uncharted 2, where you earn money by uh, playing the game, finding coins scattered around the world, hidden here and there. And you can either spend that on, say, weaponry in the game or uh, uh, a new nice avatar skin, or you can spend them on behind the scenes documentaries, which you cannot see without spending this money you have to earn by playing the game. Um, there are even games which require you to um, finish the game in God mode, which is the, the most hardcore mode of playing the game, before you actually get access to all the behind the scenes documentaries. Another example it's from the Batman, the recent Batman games. This is a screenshot from Batman Arkham City from 2011. So again, a concept, concept art gallery like the one from Tomb Raider. Um, the, these concept art, so each, each uh, drawing, uh, concept art drawing, which shows you what went into the creative process of designing the game, um, is linked to a trophy you have to find in the game. And this is just this is concept art, art gallery page two, but as you can see, there's arrows there, there's endless amounts of these you have to unlock. Um, so they are linked to Riddler trophy. So the Riddler is one of the bad guys in the Batman uh, uh, fictional world, and he has hidden all these trophies through the, through the world, and you can either find them randomly by discovering them, by you know, skulking around in the, in the fictional world, um, you also encounter some of the Riddler's thugs, and some of them actually uh, glow greenish. And if you get one of those thugs and you interrogate him by basically slapping him around a <laughs> lot, he tells you where the nearest trophies are, and they appear on the map. And the Riddler apparently also scattered maps of his own trophies here and there, which you can find. <coughs> which makes your map basically look like this. So you have all these trophies. All over the uh, uh, these all these secondary goal, goals all over your mini map, a map you can use while playing the game. So while without these trophies, you basically you only saw uh, your primary goal. For instance, the next in the next bit of the story uh, you are pursuing, uh, you know, getting the Joker, for instance. You now have all these side quests, these side missions. For instance, investigate the location revealed by the symbols. Some of these symbols. Uh, are linked to concept art. Others, however, are other unlockables. For instance, uh, again, as I mentioned, avatar skins, um, bonus levels, uh, secondary objectives, uh, new, new weapons. Uh, you don't know yet, if, uh, but you, you want to pursue them. And this is where making off media, which used to live separately on a separate disc, are actually becoming part of the achievements phenomenon, which started in the mid-2000s on a large scale. Um, so it basically means, for those who are not familiar with, uh, with uh, contemporary games or with achievements, is that there are, these are secondary goals, they are meta goals you can do in the game, which might not have anything to do with the main goal of the game, for instance, finishing the story, but have to do with uh, Collecting all these trophies, for instance, and you unlock an achievement. And this achievement, all the, your fellow players can see that you have unlocked this achievement because it's, it's also point-based. So you, can, you get points by doing this. So achievement builds actually new levels for the game experience as they invite players uh, to such activities as metagaming and also collection building. The bec making of media, therefore, are not just rewards, they also become uh, something you have to collect, not something you just basically get when you buy it, but something which you do not have when you buy the game, but have to collect through play, paratextual play. And making of media therefore also become a way more visible part of uh, uh, 
gaming as a subcultural phenomenon, as a social experience, as something you share with fellow gamers. Also, something which are, is linked to your uh, gamer identity, you could say. So, um, to move to some concluding uh, remarks. Why focus on these making of media? Why are they not just interest, uh, uninteresting marketing materials which are uh, bolted on games when you buy them? Well, for instance, what we could say is that there's a political economic perspective here. That not having direct access to making of media is actually framed by these games as a game feature. You know, adding play or even replay value. Uh, imagine buying a uh, Lord Rings DVD where you have to unlock all those 30 hours of extras. It would, would be really weird, but in, in, in games this actually has become the norm. What it also does is it, it frames players not just as an insider, a knowledgeable fan about games, but it also frames players as experts in terms of gaming credentials or gaming capital. Um, you can, by, sh by showing off how many of the making of media you actually have unlocked, you can not just show that you are a fan, but that you have the skill to actually do this in a measurable and a cu a communicable form, right? It, it actually, it, it's worth points. So why focus on this paratextual play then as a tool for meaning creation? Um, well, paratextual play in making of media of games have the potential to influence not just the interpretation of a game, but also the play through a game, through its spatial design, where it is loca located in relation to the, to the main game. It also, I, I could argue, has the potential to influence this play separate from and also before you actually reach and see uh, the actual paratextual content, the fact that you see a trophy there which might be connected to concept art, might be enough for you to, you know, to <coughs> deviate from the main primary goal of your game and change your gameplay. You haven't even seen the actual content of, the, of this paratextual element yet. And as unlockables, they also move from being an external thing which lives on a separate disc of an art book which accompanies a special edition box set to something which is integral to play. Uh, uh, a co collapsed with, uh, 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 with the game, forming uh, new play trajectories, uh, i.e. new play goals. And as a final remark then, what we see here is that text and paratext collapse, collapse in a very specific way, requir requiring us to consider or at least reconsider our approach to studying games as meaningful media objects, that we are not just talking about a game but that paratext um, actually play a major, has a major role in the way we play these games. And um, that's actually it, so if you have questions, they will follow later on. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rene. Uh, so now we've been discussing the way in which media move in and out and in of games. And the next two talks, first by Maronke Bieriga and next by Michel van Dortel, will begin to speak about mediation <coughs> itself. And Maronke will start with a talk on the aesthetics of a particular mode of mediation, namely the interface. Uh, there we go. Good evening, everyone. I am Maronke Bieriga. I'm a cultural studies student here at the Rutbout University. And as a participant of the Redbud Honors Program, I have done research in Adobe Photoshop in the last two years. Now when I say Photoshop, the general misconception is that I'm talking about things like these. I'm not. While I agree that the practice of Photoshopping has enormous consequences for our society, I also acknowledge that a great deal has already been said about it. What we tend to imply by, by talking about Photoshop Photoshopping, anyways, is that the, that the medium itself is neutral, that it can be employed by magazines, by marketeers, and so forth. Yet nothing is ever neutral, least of all graphical user interfaces like that of Photoshop, which are constructed to communicate particular things to their users. 
This is why I set out two years ago to research the GUI, the graphical user interface of Adobe Photoshop. The lack of scholarly research in this area was absolutely shocking. We do not seem to know just how a program like Photoshop, which has such an enormous impact on our lives, works, works and affects its users, how it steers them. Moreover, even in a broader sense of interfaces in general, I believe we lack a certain specific terminology. Because visual screen media are quite unlike other media in the way that they appear to us. We are used to static images, as we've seen in paintings, in posters, and so forth. We are used to moving images in cinema and in television. With the dawn of graphical user interfaces, we see images that respond to our input. What interfaces display are not merely moving images. They are interactive visual constellations. This implies that while methods of for announcing of moving and static images may be useful to some measure, they do not cover all aspects of the nature of interfaces. Interfaces are built to communicate their possibilities to their users and to show them the results of the actions that they took. Because of this interactive, communicative nature of interfaces, they exist only in a state of flux. Their content is never fixed and cannot be replayed. It is precisely this unfinished aspect of the interface that is crucial to understanding it. It always allows for change, yet it's also a partially static appearance. For otherwise, the user would not be able to learn the rules of the program. What is lacking in the debate thus far is medium-specific terminology for analyzing interfaces that takes into account the, the medium-specific interactivity, communication and fleetingness. In this presentation, I will explain the appearance concept which I have formulated in my research to help us come to terms with the way in which Adobe Photoshop works. I have regarded Adobe Photoshop as a fictional world, in which certain physics, laws and rules apply, that may be different from those in our own world. These physics or rules are constant, like gravity is a constant in our own world. In Photoshop, I as a user can be assured that the constellation of the interface will not change unless I change it. And once I have, this interface is again consolidated into a rigid form. As a user then, I can manipulate the arrangement of the interface, yet I can only do so from a particular starting point which was offered to me by the program. There is then a constant interplay between the program and its user. Often the program starts by offering a particular static state for the user to interact with. For instance, I can open a tab that was previously hidden, I can dislodge, elements from their original position, hide open windows, or even drag elements out of the program's frame. In this process, I as user am constantly faced with two things. That what is already in the frame and on which I base my actions, and that what comes into view because of my actions. And this is the basis for the appearance concept. Appearance, like the GUI, is an ambiguous term. Etymologically, it can mean both visible states and the action of coming into view. The appearance concept takes into account both the relatively static, mise and scene like and the dynamic aspects of the interface and acknowledges the ephemeral nature of the interface as well as the underlying fictional world and its possibility space. An analysis that takes into account these factors is valuable as it exposes underlying assumptions as well as manipulative or discursive aspects and in interfaces. An interface, as we've seen, consists both of static elements and dynamic elements. Neither of these can do without the other. They are inextricably intertwined. Only through static elements can dynamic elements be communicated to the user and consequently be displayed to form new affordances, which are clues about how to interact with something for that user. Likewise, if everything were dynamic and everything could change, then it would be quite hard to learn the rules of the program. If there were no things in the world of which you can be sure, for instance, that pushing the same, the button, the same button with the same settings will produce a similar result every time, we would not be able to learn how to function within that world. 
Therefore, the interface offers its user a semi-rigid framework of static elements which allow for sensible dynamic elements. It is, however, important to note that the two aspects, static and dynamic, do not function as binary oppositions. They function more as like both ends of a gradual scale. The various interface elements can move along this scale over time and are not just either or, they can be both static and dynamic. For example, often relatively static forms, like a button, can change or hold the promise of changing. The difference between static form and the coming into view is then a theoretical one, one that is meant to clarify the way in which interfaces continuously oscillate between these states. The interface to acquaint us with this unfamiliar world presents us with appearances, visible states and the action of coming into view. The Photoshop canvas itself is a visible form, a at first blank, coloured or transparent shape around which the interface seems to be revolving. But only through action is its metaphorical relation to the traditional canvas affirmed, as that of a surface to be worked upon. Furthermore, while the canvas seems to be flat at first sight, as a visible form, the true depth of this canvas cannot be uncovered through layers, through the action of coming into view. A canvas is traditionally a flat surface. While it seems to be true for Photoshop at first glance, it is in fact not so. The Photoshop canvas is built up out of layers, like a painting is built up out of layers of paint, if you will. But where the layers of paint are inextricably merged together and are thus superficial, the Photoshop layers can be rearranged, removed, worked on without altering the other layers. What the user is seeing, however, is a flat surface, even though he or she is actually working in depth. Through the working process, then, the depth of the canvas comes into view, while its static flatness is still visible as well. Traditional painting gave the illusion of depth on a two-dimensional surface by, for example, overlapping planes. The surface of Photoshop literally has depth. The green circle we see here is literally deeper down than the rectangle and the triangle. Additionally, where in traditional painting it would be assumed by the beholder that the shape would continue where it is covered, it does continue in Photoshop, as we can see from the lines highlighting the, the move shape and the layer tab on the left, Right, for you guys, sorry. Um, the Photoshop canvas thus presents itself as a visible state, as a flat surface. Yet by the arranging of layers, we can arrange this flat surface and bring into view its depthless depth. The history panel constantly documents what happens on the canvas. Adobe describes this as follows. You can use the history panel to jump to any recent state of the image created during the current working session. Each time you apply a change to an image, the new state of that image is added to the panel. Thus, in Photoshop's world, we don't need to be a time lord. Anyone can travel through time. The user can move back in history to revisit, re revisit what he or she had done at an earlier moment in time. In the history panel, the dynamic action of coming to view is caught in a static element, in form. Yet, e um, in essence, uh, it, is, it is a static document of dynamic interaction. Yet even before doing anything on the canvas, there is already a history in the form of a snapshot of the blind canvas. The beginning of history then precedes the first action on the canvas, opposed to traditional painting. The creative process, the history panel tells us, begins when we create a canvas. Where the Bible begins, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, Photoshop starts with, in the beginning, there was a canvas. Yet it also tells us something else. It tells us something about the way in which it assumes the creative process to take place. The user is to start from visible forms, the canvas and the first entry in the history panels, for example, and respond to them. In summary, Photoshop makes particular assumptions about its user and the assumed working process being a constant response on the program's static forms. It thereby influences users and makes particular claims about the creative process. In this way, it reaffirms existing discourse on creative production. 
While the nature of these claims certainly need more research to either con confirm or disprove them, I am convinced that a program like Photoshop completely does away with the traditional practices of art making. A first way in which it does so is by its reversibility. When the user made a mistake, it can be reversed without altering or affecting other layers. The reversibility ties in with a particular kind of temporality which the interface affords. Photoshop, by allowing the user to reverse actions, and not only the most recent one, allows for a different kind of temporality than traditional painting does. While, the further, re while further research will have to show that these differences actually affect the process of art making, it is nevertheless an interesting thought, and with it I have reached the end of this brief presentation. I hope that I have been able to give you some insight in the way in which a program like Photoshop operates and influences us as users. As a last statement, I would like to end with the following. I believe it is time to not only focus on the appearance of celebrities in Photoshop pictures, but also on the appearance of the program that facilitates it. I would like to thank you for your attention and look forward to any questions that you might have during the panel discussion later this evening. Thank you very much. speaker is uh, Michel van Dato, um, author, curator, uh, tutor, educator, and he's going to talk today uh, about his involvement with uh, Renzo Martins' Institute for Human Activities. So we're gradually moving from Photoshop, from the realm of this kind of mediation, to uh, materiality and objects and chocolate, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, first of all, thanks for, for this opportunity to speak here uh, tonight. Um, I was especially intrigued when I received the invitation to speak here uh, by the invitation to bring a technological artifact uh, to the discussion tonight. And um, as I happened to have a technological artifact on my desk when I received the invitation that had caused a minor curatorial existential crisis in my practice. So I figured the best thing to do is to grab the bull by the horns and uh, use my 15 minutes tonight to uh, pick your brains on how to overcome uh, this crisis. So I'm going to spend my time actually introducing the problem that this object posed to me and I'll also pass around the object to you later on for you to have a closer look at. Um, uh, to go to that problem I actually need to introduce my practice a little bit uh, beforehand I guess. So um, that's what I'm going to do uh, first. Um, when you think of new media art you, you probably uh, have the image of art exploring new uh, the possibilities of new media and the possibilities of technologies. And to a certain extent, or actually to a large extent, that is definitely true. And also a large part of my practice has been based on doing just that, sort of pushing the boundaries of technology through artistic exploration, uh, often guided by aesthetic goals and by uh, uh, artistic aims, uh, etc. So I'm just going to give you some examples so you get a feel of what my practice looks like. So uh, in 2007 I was involved, for instance, in, cur uh, in curating uh, a whole series of uh, what we call exercise in immersion. And uh, we co produced some work together with uh, Marx de Nijs, a Rotterdam based artist, on uh, what immersion really is and how you could actually uh, provoke it in a user. And we did tons of experiments, and I thought this was number four was, uh, is still my favorite. Uh, you walk into a big industrial space, and uh, there's some virtual balls that fly around you. You're actually wearing this suit, right? This is 2007. This stuff didn't come off the shelf. You actually had to produce it with a team of, I think, about five or six nerds in making this. Um, uh, but in the end, we ended up with a fairly uh, convinc uh, convincing uh, uh, game world in which you walk through this industrial space, there would be uh, virtual balls floating around you, and your task was to capture these balls. At least, that was sort of the instruction that you were given. Uh, but as you progressed in this game, as you caught more and more of these balls, uh, more and more of your surroundings would actually turn into virtual surroundings. So gradually, as the, the game increased, uh, your, uh, uh, common, the common reality would be overtaken by a virtual reality. And only when you would sort of get bored with the game or decide to take a break from it, uh, differences started to strike. And that's, all, that also, that's also what made this game so invasive and so immersive, is that you were so preoccupied with these balls that you never really uh, felt that you were immersing into a virtual, virtual environment. So, 
Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, a lot of work that I did uh, in my practice, especially through my affiliation with uh, V2, the Institute for Uncivil Media in Rotterdam, uh, is a whole bunch of works on, uh, on wearable technologies. And uh, One work we did together with an artist, uh, Dan Boosgaard, that you may know, uh, in a collaboration with Marge Dexa, is develop a dress that becomes see-through when you get closer to it. And although this project actually originated over a beer talk, it's true, um, uh, and there is a humoristic side to it, uh, it's actually also very, it's a very confrontational social scenario as well, which I only, real, well, not really only realized, but which I was confronted with when I was actually the person interviewing uh, the model in this dress at the big premiere of this dress, and I was constantly sort of trying to sort of find an appropriate distance to her to not like have her but answer these questions fully naked in front of hundreds of people. And I didn't succeed and actually received complaints afterwards. Um, anyway, so a large part of my practice and also uh, a lot of the stuff I've been doing in the past is, is about exploring new media, about sort of pushing the boundaries and see what we can do with these new media. and also sort of envisioning uh, futures for these technologies. Um, but over the years I've also started I've had begun to sort of doubt when this is the, the best use of this sort of free autonomous thinking space that art is. And I sort of kept coming to the conclusion that there's actually a much more urgent thing to do and to use this uh, free thinking space that art is for, and that's uh, questioning new media, so critically looking at uh, new media. And over the years, even without me really noticing, my interest sort of started in uh, to shift in that direction. Just to give you some examples, I worked uh, with Aaron Bartel a lot, and maybe you've seen this uh, project come by on the internet somewhere, it really turned into a meme. Uh, it's a project called Dead Drops, and basically it's, uh, it's a series of workshops that Aaron Bartel gives all around the world, where he uh, does nothing else except for uh, stripping USB sticks and uh, uh, sticking them into the walls and cracks in your urban environments to basically create an offline peer-to-peer -peer file sharing system. Um, and it's actually working, uh, people upload stuff and people take stuff from it. Uh, but what's interesting about the work, and what's also the, the criticality of the work, is that once you start using this thing, and I'm sure there's some in Nijmegen as well, you can actually look up on the website where they, uh, where they are located in your uh, surroundings. But the, the criticality of the project is in that you really feel the difference between sharing a file online and sharing a file offline. And suddenly, uh, suddenly sharing files feels much more like borrowing a library book to a, to a friend rather than doing something very illegal sneakily in a, a non a, a anonymity of the, of the internet. So it, it raises questions about the difference between offline and online behavior that I think are very important to talk about. Uh, to also here show you a bit of the bandwidth of, of, of criti critical projects I'm involved in. Um, this is a project I did together with design duo Cohen van Baal uh, called 75 Watts. And basically what they uh, try to do in this uh, 75 watt project is make a critical statement on the part that uh, design has in creating a control structure between uh, consumer demands and us as consumers of consumer technology and uh, the chore choreography of uh, factory workers in, in these big Chinese factories where uh, consumer technologies are made. And how did they actually make the statement or how did they put the focus on it? They did that by radically turning this control structure around. So they choreographed a choreography for Chinese factory workers and then uh, uh, this choreography produced a project, a completely useless project that sort of came out of the movement that these Chinese factory workers had, had to make. Uh, and we exhibit this, uh, uh, this now uh, as, a, as a dance film. So you see Chinese factory workers doing this dance uh, and a series of objects that result. So it's a critical look at the role that design plays in this control structure between consumer demands and the movement of uh, Chinese factory workers, which basically translates them into sort of puppets in the, in the, in the factory. Um, Okay, so uh, as, a, as a curator, I'm not just involved in the production of new work, of course I also curate uh, exhibitions, and I also there really turned focus from sort of exploring t uh, technologies and the possibilities of new technologies to more critical stances, and uh, I'm just going to give you one example, and that was uh, an exhibition I co-curated for the Dutch Electronic Art Festival last year at the New Institute, uh, and this dealt with the notion of the progress trap. I'm not, I'm not sure if if you've heard of Ronald Wright before, somehow he's not so uh, 
famous in the in the media uh, media circles. Uh, but this is a book I can highly recommend to you because what Ronald Wright basically introduced is the notion of the progress trap and the progress trap. Or and in the book, he's looking at how some of the uh, actually most of the innovations we do uh, to solve certain problems result in bigger problems. And of course, for these bigger problems. We need more innovations that often result in even bigger problems. And uh, he's basically he follows uh, the, the history of technology, uh, uh, of human created technology, and figures that the state we're in right now is the result of this innovation basically spinning completely out of control. And that's what he calls the, the progress trap an innovation leading to a bigger problem, uh, followed by innovation. To, to a bigger problem. And we had a group show to sort of uh, embody that theme uh, uh, um, from different perspectives and also offering some potential ways out. And uh, we had also had Ronald Wright there to, to open the exhibition at the SKU. Um, uh, I'm now working uh, on an exhibition uh, for the end of this year which uh, has the work title uh, Data in the 21st Century. It's looking at some of the ideas that Piketty posed in uh, capital in the 21st century, but especially looking at how his ideas are tangled up with technologies and also, also how technologies end up, I'm sure you're familiar, somewhat familiar with uh, Piketty's uh, ideas that uh, capital is, is, is moving towards uh, less and less uh, hands basically to hold that capital and I, th I think the same goes for technology and uh, I share some, of, uh, some similar concerns uh, as Piketty regarding technology, that the power over technology and the, the, the ownership of data is also increasingly moving to bigger corporations and less and less uh, people. So uh, I'm planning to sort of explore <coughs> that relation between technology and some of Piketty's ideas in this exhibition. But what it sort of brought me back to is a classic uh, discussion in the uh, science and technology study. And it's, uh, a discussion that's best depicted by, by these two camps, or actually these two figures. On the left we have Thomas Friedman, on the right we have Richard Florida, uh, who are names uh, some of you may be familiar with, but uh, Thomas Friedman on the left is famous for writing the book The World is Flat, and basically in that book claiming that, um, that uh, globalization, which is uh, a, uh, sort of supported by technology, will lead to that everyone in the world will be connected to everyone and everything and therefore resources will become available to anyone and inequality in the world will slowly sort of evaporate. Um, Richard Florida is one of the sort of strongest proponents against this idea and he wrote a big, uh, a strong critique uh, on it. Uh, this is already happening in the mid 90s somewhere. Um, and Florida uh, writes like, no, you have it all wrong, uh, Thomas Friedman. Uh, actually, uh, in the end, the access that we have to technology is as inequally divided, and therefore, uh, maybe technology will sort of uh, connect more parts of the world to more parts of the world, but this access to technology will only concentrate more, and therefore, make the world more spiky. If you're in one of these urban metropoles where technology is accessible, where there's airports, etc. Yes, you have, an, you have an advantage and you will be more connected. But if you're living in rural and poor parts of the world, you'll actually uh, lag behind even more. So it will only emphasize, this, uh, emphasize these differences. Um, so my, my feeling was that actually this whole uh, Friedman argument solely slowly sort of disappeared and everyone was sort of in the, in the Florida camp or had similar arguments against Friedman until uh, this guy uh, showed up, the 3D printer, and I'm sure you've, uh, uh, many of you have followed the hype around 3D printers. Um, it, I mean, nothing wrong with the 3D printer, but the way it's sort of sold to us over, over uh, the past years is that this 3D printer will create a revolution, it will democratize the making process, it will empower people. And uh, I got this from a BBC uh, news report, which is titled, 3D printing, a force for revolutionary change. And all of this rhetoric is sort of based on the idea that if you give someone a 3D printer, uh, he or she is able to sort of create value with this, and uh, this will sort of democratize the making process and will allow anyone to sort of have a better life making, uh, making some, uh, well, earning some money probably. So this is very much the sort of free money and rhetoric uh, that we earlier sort of uh, got away with uh, uh, saying that, that this is wrong because it's, it's spiky. If, if you're living in some sort of rural uh, part of a very poor country, you don't have access to 3D print technologies, even not if it's an ultimate and you can order it for like a hundred bucks. Um, 
So I sort of easily uh, got, a, got away with, uh, or I actually often criticized the whole 3D print uh, philosophy that this will democratize uh, the making process uh, until uh, this guy uh, popped up on uh, my desk. Actually, it didn't pop up on my desk. I was uh, usually uh, responsible for the fact that it appeared on my desk. Um, so this is the object I've been sort of working towards, and I have two uh, examples with which you can pass around. Uh, you can look inside, get the paper, uh, uh, take it out. No, I'll just leave it inside because in the end it isn't edible. But you don't want too many people touching it uh, if you still want to eat it. Um, now, uh, while you have a look at, uh, and also smell it, it smells delicious. Uh, while you have a look at these uh, sculptures, I'll explain why these, ob uh, why these objects cause this sort of minor uh, uh, crisis in my practice. Because I was always very clearly on the, on the uh, floor that can in this debate. Uh, I didn't really uh, believe that you could sort of, uh, that technology would in the end resolve inequality in the world. Uh, I, I was very much with the floor that can, where I thought like it will only um, emphasize these, uh, uh, these differences. Um, this chocolate uh, sculpture is the first artistic output of a project by uh, Renzo Martins called the Institute for Human Activities. And in this project he is setting, he set up a art organization in the jungle of Congo. And now why would you want to do that? He has a very simple philosophy for this. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea of gentrification, right? You pick up some cognitive labor uh, somewhere, uh, uh, some designers, some artists, some other creative types that, that are not sort of location bound. They don't necessarily need to do it here. They could also do it there. You pick them up and you bring them to a sort of uh, a poor part of town or a sort of impoverished part of your neighborhood. Uh, you let them have a nice office there and while they sort of create value uh, through their cognitive labor, they end up spending that money locally anyway because they need to grab a coffee in the lunch break and they need to go to the supermarket out of work. So uh, through this sort of gentrification process, you, you um, implement a, a sort of economic injection into these uh, neighborhoods, uh, usually in our, in our case, uh, and therefore sort of these neighborhoods and the, the general wealth that sort of lift, lifts up. Renzo's idea was, why don't we actually apply this to the parts in the world where people are really suffering, where they're really hungry? And he, uh, he did some previous work in Congo, um, so he had some context there, and he thought, like, let's, try with the, uh, let's try this out with these people in the jungle of Congo. Let's see if we can make gentrification work in, uh, in Congo as well. So he set up this Institute for Human Activities, which is basically an arts institute, and uh, they had a grant opening, uh, etc., to attract uh, attention from uh, all the workers in the, in the neighborhood. And he ended up working with a group of cacao plantation workers that started joining art workshop in his institute. And he, basically what he's trying to do is he's uh, trying to reschool these plantation workers into artists to, to find out if they can make a more sustainable living from their artistic engagement with cacao plantation work than they can from the actual plantation work that they do day in, day out. Um, and of course, at first, this, this was sort of received sort of with, with a laugh, like, are you serious? Uh, I think uh, the, the Guardian even wrote an article and saying uh, the, the man that wants to gentrify the jungle, and it was sort of a comical thing, as if he wasn't serious, but he was very serious about this. And, uh, the first, oh, sorry, I have to go. the first thing, uh, the first results of these workshops were uh, a series of sculptures. So they had a bunch of artists, uh, international and Congolese artists, coming in to teach these plantation workers how to make sculptures. Uh, they ended up making self-portraits, which were beautiful. They, they really had uh, a talent for this, and um, their idea was uh, that these self-portraits should actually be. Uh, be made out of chocolate, the stuff that their whole lives is basically uh, basically re revolving around. They also had to be made of chocolate because they're, they are kind of annoyed with the fact that they've never tasted or seen any chocolate. The only thing they do is pick the beans and ship them off. So they wanted these uh, cell portraits to, to be uh, made out of chocolate, also to make sort of critical uh, stands there. And, uh, but it's, hot, it's very difficult to export things out of Congo. So these river clay models that they made had to be turned into chocolate here because there's no chocolate in Congo, there's only chocolate beans. 
Uh, and that was a very hard thing to do for them because they couldn't transport these, uh, these scale models, these, uh, these self-portraits from River Clay uh, by themselves. Uh, there's no mailman in Congo and it's very hard to get things over the border because you really have to bribe. Um, so Renzo was in a bit of panic because he had a deadline for a show with these Congolese artists in, uh, in uh, Cardiff. Um, which is where he contacted V2 to say if we could come up with some sort of technological solution to this. So that's what we ended up providing them with. We made this uh, technological scheme consisting of stuff that was actually already around. We just made some uh, couplings, which is a device, uh, well, a, a, a photo, photographic app basically, uh, to photograph the sculpture in 3D uh, that was sent uh, to our technical guys at V2, who turned it into a model. Then we ended up 3D printing, and of course there is the clue, 3D printing uh, these, uh, these hats, uh, these sculptures, and then passing them on to the chocolate shade to turn them into, into chocolate sculpture, to, to turn them into molds for the chocolate sculptures. And mind you, the, the chocolate that he used is actually the chocolate that, uh, these be that, uh, that was made out of the beans that these Congolese plantation workers picked. Um, so in the end, it worked out. Um, these chocolate sculptures were realized just in time for the show in, in Cardiff and I ended up, uh, oh, and of course the idea in the end is that these sculptures should generate some value, some money that, goes, that travels back to Congo. So my idea was to uh, curate a pop-up store which is also a very a common strategy nowadays for artists to uh, next to an art biennial, also have a pop-up store with some multiples to sell. So uh, we had a pop-up store for a month in Rotterdam between Art Rotterdam and the Museum Night, and we tried to sort of sell as many of these chocolate sculptures as possible. And the big guys went for quite a quite a lot of money, but we also had these small ones that you've uh, you've seen just now, and we sold quite a few of them. At least enough for Renzo to go back to Congo and present a few small envelopes with quite a bit of money in there uh, for, these, for these artists. Art, uh, money that they earned with their uh, artistic engagement with their plantation work. And of course, what they, the first thing it did was they threw a party. They grabbed some of the money, invested it in a local chef to make some food. The local chef spent that money to, uh, to uh, pay some local farmers to, uh, to give them some produce to cook. Uh, they had some uh, uh, local uh, local drinks, etc. So the money already started sort of rippling out in Congo, really sort of gentrifying this part of the jungle. There is there is an economic sort of incentive, uh, not incentive, but an injection there that is already having effect, uh, and that's why uh, when I turned back to this guy, I figured, well, maybe there's a little bit more to Friedman uh, than I would ever expect myself to admit to. Because in the end, what we did is we used some technology to uh, allow these Congolese, Congolese plantation workers to enter a European art market. So in the end, this technology actually made the world a little bit more equal uh, to the extent, well, that they now have some money to spend to throw a party at least. Um, uh, but the question is, oh, this is kind of messed up. Uh, but I also still have to say that most uh, of what happened uh, uh, in the two decades after this debate is only uh, is support for uh, Florida's point, saying that the, uh, that the differences only are emphasized through technology. So the question that I want to throw out uh, here tonight is, where, where, sh where are we in this debate? Do, is, is the issue for your activities work an example that proves that maybe there's a little bit more uh, to say for Friedman's idea that the, that the world becomes flat and that technology actually helps resolve some inequality? Or are we, most of us, probably still with Florida saying that technology only makes the world more spiky and, and uh, emphasizes these inequalities? So that's what I wanted to actually throw out there and uh, ask for your comments on. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. I think we'll save those questions okay. and have some perhaps your tips and advice to Michelle. I'm sure all of you have lots of advice on this matter um, for the panel later. Um, there will be a 15 minute break and half past we'll return with Mary Law Ryan. Um, to start off, and after that we'll have a panel inviting all the speakers and trying to tie some of those very disparate uh, threads together.
So thanks, and we'll see you in 15 minutes. There's probably coffee, tea, and you can get beers and bottles of vodka. There's coffee and tea. All right, in the hallway. Key figures, I think it's fair to say, literary studies and linguistics over the past two decades, two, two three decades, um, was written extensively on narratives, on the relationships between narratives and other media, on the relationships between narratives and cybertext and avatars, who's the author of such books, at the book that I really used for my PhD, an enormous amount of book on fictional worlds from the early 90s, I think. Fictional world's artificial intelligence, uh, but also on the, on avatars and uh, the avatars of story, um, and perhaps most famously, uh, narratives as virtual reality. I'm super happy that Maronka and Michelle found her willing to join us here today, and she could uh, put this in her busy schedule. Um, so, without further ado, um, please welcome with a great applause, Marie Laurent Ryan. <laughs> franchises that develop around uh, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter. It seems that every uh, cult narrative, every successful narrative engenders a uh, transmedia empire when you have film, computer games, comics, etc., uh, etc. Et so in a sense, I'm uh, playing the devil's advocate when I say there's such a thing as transmedia storytelling. What I want to ask uh, in this presentation is whether it's really new or if we have had, had it for a long time, and whether we can really call it transmedia storytelling. And um, to answer that question, I will take as my, uh, um, I will use uh, Henry Jenkins' definition because Henry Jenkins is really the, the father of this uh, notion. So, and this comes from his blog. Transmedia storytelling represents a process where integral elements of a fiction get dispersed systematically across multiple delivery channels for the purpose of creating a unified and coordinated entertainment experience. Ideally, each medium makes its own unique contribution to the unfolding of the story. The italics are Jenkins, not mine. So, um, Consider a, a transmedia franchise such as Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, it started as fan fiction to, uh, to what um, Stephanie Meyer's Twilight Saga. I understood that Stephanie was not very happy about that. <laughs> uh, then uh, this uh, fan fiction developed into a series of very successful novels. It was turned into a movie, which was uh, released on Valentine's Day. And it was accompanied by all sorts of gimmicks such as uh, teddy bears, uh, photos of wine, and of course sex toys, which were sold in the US in three family stores. So, <laughs> is this transmedia storytelling? As you know, this is not uh, transmedia storytelling, this is marketing. So, um, if transmedia storytelling to be a truly new narrative experience, I think it will be useful to take a look at uh, older uh, phenomena that can be part of it, but if uh, transmedia storytelling is really new, it should be different. Uh, oops. Oh, will, how do I go back? Oh, you probably need to the keyboard then. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, hmm. oh. Okay, so what transmedia storytelling is not, what I may include. First, adaptation and illustration. We've had that uh, since uh, the Greeks, since uh, the Middle Ages, with biblical stories, with uh, <coughs> myths, they appear in illustration, they appear in text, they are being retold. So is this transmedia storytelling? I would say no, because um, these um, illustration and adaptation arise 
bottom up. There is a narrative that acquires so much uh, cultural significance that it spontaneously generates a uh, version in other media, but there is not this deliberate dispersion of uh, content that uh, Jenkins was uh, talking about. So I call this a grassroots uh, phenomenon. <coughs> Because I, oh, okay, so my next uh, uh, item <laughs> was, uh, okay, back to adaptation and, and illustration. Uh, here's what... Um, transmedia, you take your story and you put it in another medium. But it is not transmedia storytelling because it is simply representing an existing story rather than expanding and annotating the fictional world. So for uh, Jenkins, adaptation or illustration are not transmedia storytelling. I hope I get, <laughs> get to <laughs> Okay, so this is how Jenkins consists adaptation. You have a story that hopefully both the novel and the film will uh, uh, transmit, but because novel and film have different affordances, uh, they cannot really uh, convey exactly the same sum of meanings, so that the story world will be different, but uh, the story is only uh, part of the story world. And how, this is how Jenkins conceives uh, transmedia storytelling. You have a, story world that may be generated by uh, a novel, uh, a original <coughs> work, and each additional uh, work, the comics, film, video games, or stories, adds another layer to this world. So we think that adaptation does not do that. <coughs> Second, uh, transmedia storytelling involves but cannot be reduced to a phenomenon that uh, Richard Saint-Gelais could need to critical transfictionality. What is transfictionality? It's the migration of uh, fictional objects, mostly characters, uh, across different texts. And uh, that's a phenomenon that uh, uh, started uh, with uh, the print. I think that the first uh, novel that generated transfictionality was Don Quixote when another author wrote a second part to the Quixote. Mm -hmm. And that inspired Cervantes to write his own uh, second part. Another uh, work that generated lots of transfictionality was Robinson uh, Crusoe. And transfictionality usually uh, revolves around three operations. One is expansion. Uh, then when you um, lengthen the period of time that's represented in the story, so when you have prequels or sequels, uh, that is expansion. Second, you can have modification. You have works that change the fate of a character. Uh, so uh, there was, in the 18th century, some works that uh, rewrote King Lear and Ophelia instead of uh, um, dying tragically uh, survived. Ophelia, <laughs> uh, not King Lear, but uh, Hamlet. <laughs> and then you can have transposition. Transposition is when you take a story and you trans uh, transpose it to another world. So that's what happens when uh, a Greek myth is set in a modern world. So uh, James Joyce's uh, Ulysses would be an example of transposition. So transmedia storytelling could be regarded as a, ca a case of transfictionality uh, that uh, operates across different media, because in transfictionality, uh, the, other, the second work can use the same medium. But I think that of the three operations that I have mentioned, only uh, extension is common in, uh, in uh, transmedia storytelling. Expansion places users in a familiar territory where modification and especially transposition force people to alter the existing representation of a story and uh, 
usually the copyright holders of the, of the original narrative uh, are protective of their content and they uh, discourage uh, operations that will change the world. So I think that most of uh, transmedia storytelling is uh, expansion. Should, uh, transmedia storytelling should not be confused with the use of various media uh, to advertise a certain narrative. Here's an example of what I do not consider to be transmedia storytelling. There was a film by Steven Spielberg called AI, Artificial Intelligence, and it was advertised with an alternate reality game called The Beast, and, uh, so, which of course uh, took place over the internet. You had two different media, but this is not transmedia storytelling because uh, they were next to no relation between the plot of AI and the plot of The Beast. So uh, this was just a marketing uh, plot. And finally, uh, transmedia storytelling should not be confused with multimodal narration. Uh, multimodal narration is when you have visual or textual or even audio signs. Uh, cinema is naturally multimodal because you have the soundtrack, you have the dialogue, you have images. You can also, comics are uh, multimodal, you have the picture and you have uh, uh, the text. So, uh, transmedia storytelling uh, may involve multimodal documents, but uh, um, it's, not, it's more than multimodality because in a multimodal work, you need all the signs to tell you the story. Think of what would happen if you take a comic strip and you remove the text. Uh, you couldn't follow the story. While in transmedia storytelling, you should be able to pick and choose uh, which documents you want to, to consume, and each document should be autonomous. So that's the difference between multimodality and transmedia. <coughs> the label transmedia storytelling suggests that uh, narrative content forms a unified story which means a self-contained uh, uh, type of meaning that follows, as you probably know, Aristotle said that the story must have a beginning, middle, and end. So transmedia storytelling suggests that uh, it tells one story that uh, has a beginning, middle, and end. But this really doesn't work. Imagine how annoying it would be if you would have to read a novel to get the beginning, then view a movie to get the middle, and then play a computer game, uh, to view the end. This is not how transmedia storytelling uh, functions. So um, I think that uh, transmedia is not a serial. It does not tell a single story. It uh, tells a number of autonomous stories or episodes that are contained in various uh, documents. And what holds this story together is that they take place in the same story world. So that, uh, and uh, why do people uh, consume the various uh, objects of a transmedia system? It's, it's because they are in love with the story world. And they want to uh, return to it as often as they can, or they want to collect as many objects <coughs> as uh, they can that relate to the story world. It's not, uh, it's not like in the Sherlock Holmes stories where you, you have to reconstitute a story that was happened uh, in the old days by look at, looking at various uh, clues that are maybe contained in various media. No, that is not uh, transmedia storytelling. There is, it's not the reconstruction of one story, it's just getting many different stories about the same world. Therefore, uh, the world, the fictional world, is dominant and should be really be called transmedia world. We can rank uh, narrative genres according to the relative prominence of the world or the plot, a plot I mean story. For instance, tragedy and jokes are plot dominant, while uh, <coughs> science fiction or fantasy are world dominant. And it turns out that most of the genres that uh, generate transmedia empires are the plot dominant, uh, uh, I mean the, <laughs> the world dominant genres. Because it's much easier to add another story to a world than to like a plot. Now I'd like to return to Rankin's um, <coughs> definition. Uh, 
when it's not a little bit rules. So I'm showing you again um, the definition, and it says that the documents must uh, compare it for a unified and coordinated entertainment experience. This uh, presupposes that um, there must be some kind of uh, top-down uh, design. It's, it, um, some uh, author decide to give narrative content to this medium and uh, content to this uh, medium. It should, it should be planned from the very beginning uh, as, a, as a whole. But what happens if we look at all the various uh, transmedia franchises? They arise bottom up. Uh, you, they arise around a narrative that has already achieved popularity, such as uh, the Harry Potter novels or the Lord of the Rings novels. And uh, uh, the developers take advantage of this popularity and they add more and more objects, uh, they explode uh, uh, the, the cow <laughs> of, of this uh, popularity. So is there, is there any, but this definition, as I said, presupposes a top-down design of the bottom up. Are there any uh, transmedia franchises that are conceived from the very beginning top-down? Um, I'll give you an example. <coughs> The, the Matrix. Most people know about the, the three films, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but from the very beginning, the Wachowski brothers, or brother and sister, conceived uh, the Matrix as being a transmedia system, and together with the films, they released a number of anime films which were a commission to a variety of artists. They were comics and they were uh, computer games. So it was, even though most people know only about the films, uh, it was really conceived top down as a transmedia uh, system. And the, the structural uh, feature of the matrix is that uh, each uh, Members of the system should make you want to uh, consult other media to fill in uh, missing information. And an example is from uh, the movie uh, The Matrix uh, Reloaded. In The Matrix Reloaded, you have an episode where uh, Neo, the hero, meets a character known as a kid. And there's some dialogue, and from the dialogue, you understand that they already know each other. But you have never seen the kid in the movies. So there's a backstory that is not told in the movies, it's told in another uh, media object, namely in one of the anime films. And in this anime film, uh, you have uh, uh, Neo contacting the kid through the cell phone, and the kid commits himself to the cause of Neo, then is pursued by the agents, then he falls from the roof, uh, trying to escape the agents, and instead of getting killed, he falls into another world, which happens to be the real world, where he meets Neo and uh, Trinity. So uh, you, need to, uh, you need the anime film to understand the backstory of uh, the movie to make this uh, story really coherent, which means that uh, this is the structure of uh, the various documents of uh, the Matrix is like a piece of Swiss cheese. It has plot holes. <laughs> and the other media fill in uh, the plot holes. And you get a more and more expanded and a more and more coherent view of the story world. But it doesn't mean that you can enter the system through any of its uh, uh, members. I doubt that there are people who first watch the anime film and then go to the feature film. Most, uh, Virtually everybody will see the feature films first. And I think that the plot holes of the feature films are not nearly as big. They are really uh, secondary details. I mean, you don't really know, need to know how uh, new <coughs> kid. But if you want the anime film 
uh, without having seen the feature film. You wouldn't know that the real world uh, is really not real, but it's a virtual reality created by the machines. You wouldn't know who Mio is. You wouldn't know who the agents are. So there would be gigantic plot holes that uh, you couldn't uh, uh, fill, and the experience would be very unsatisfactory. Well, in a film, yes, there are plot holes, but the spectators are so distracted from the logic of the plot by the special effects that they don't pay attention to these uh, plot holes. And I think that's uh, uh, something that's very common in today's film, in that uh, the special effect distracts you from the logic of the plot and then from the real of the plot. talk about uh, the choice of world. Um, most uh, transmedia franchises take place in fantastic worlds or in science fiction worlds. Is this necessary? Uh, I don't think so, but I think there is a special affinity between uh, the idea of transfictionality and uh, uh, fantastic worlds. And um, my reason is that to construct a fantastic world, it takes a lot of cognitive effort, much more than uh, to read a novel about the real world. And why does it take more cognitive effort? It's because you have to construct this world entirely out of the text. You cannot use your uh, experience of life uh, as much. Like if a, a, a novel t talks about a horse, you can use your uh, experience of horse to visualize it. But if your uh, fantastic text has gorfs, how do you visualize a gorf? You have to rely on the text and you must uh, really construct this gorf. So in transmedia storytelling, um, it's, uh, since you have already taken uh, the trouble of constructing a word uh, out of, of a text, it returns uh, to a, a, a world that was already present in your imagination, and so you don't have to, to uh, go back to this difficult process of world construction. It's like, I call it a return of uh, investment. So you already know who the characters of Harry Potter are, you know who the characters are of uh, Lord of the Ring are. Of course, this, would have, uh, this effect would also occur with realistic world, but uh, I think it's, uh, the, the effort of construction is much uh, stronger with fantastic world, and that's why um, trans media uses uh, fantastic world. Second, um, Science media franchises tend to develop around blockbuster films, which are themselves usually adaptation of best-selling uh, novels. And in this age of uh, global uh, uh, cultural and economic globalization, Hollywood tends to uh, uh, cater to the entire world rather than to uh, uh, a small uh, part of the world. And uh, if you want to make a film that is popular in China, you have better chances if you uh, work with a fantastic world than if you uh, work with a world that is highly uh, uh, cultural, I mean, uh, geographically or historically contingent. I think that the uh, Chinese relate to fan fantasy world much better than they re relate to a realistic uh, world that come out of a certain period of uh, Western history. And finally, the predominance of fantastic world in transmedia can be explained by the fact that these uh, franchises are usually aimed at adolescents and young adults. And if, if you think of all the stories that are told to you as kids, they are all, the very first stories are always fantastic stories. They are about talking animals, they are fairy tales, they are mesh, and it's only later in your development that you get realistic stories. And even if you look at the literature for young adults, there is lots of uh, fantastic uh, in this literature. For instance, 
Uh, you can have uh, high school students who have to save the world from zombies and uh, monsters. And so the, you have your fantastic elements that stir the imagination, but you can also relate to the hero who is a high school student. So you have a, a fusion of uh, the real world and a fantastic world. Or think about something like uh, uh, Hunger Games or uh, Divergent. You have a uh, Kids who have to save the world from some kind of uh, uh, futuristic, dystopic uh, uh, state. So I think that uh, the fantastic the science fiction really appeals to uh, young people. Another uh, reason why um, the developers of transmedia target uh, youth fantastic world so much that young people are avid collectors of objects. They will buy the Lego games, they will buy the computer game, uh, much more than adults would. OK, so that's uh, the reason why I think that uh, uh, fantastic calls are so But there is no reason why uh, Transpedia could not take as its subject matter the real world, or even realistic story. If you think about the real world, news stories usually come to us through multiple media. They come through television, they come through newspapers, they come through movies, later there are books. And um, so I think it's much more, uh, when we are interested in a new story developed, for instance, there is a crime, and you are very interested in that crime, you will uh, grab any medium that you can uh, find to. Uh, reconstruct the idea of the crime. Therefore, I think that the transmedia has a real um, a future in journalism. And I think that's a movement that's now developing the use of transmedia for something that's called slow journalism. Um, slow journalism is, um, rather than uh, being interested in breaking news, it's uh, the development of uh, a broad topic. And so you could have topics such as climate change, the Holocaust, Ill 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 um, illegal Ill immigration, which uh, could really be uh, treated in a transmedia way, because you could have interviews, you could have film, you could have photos, you could have text. Now I'll uh, give you an example. Uh, the Sochi project. <coughs> Have you heard, has anybody heard of the Sochi project? Oh. It was developed by two Dutch journalists, and uh, it was about uh, the site of the uh, Olympics. Uh, so I'll show you a video that will give you a good idea of the um, purpose of this. Thank you. 
throw in something. In <laughs> so you can guess uh, what the project is. It's a website that uh, tells you what is behind the shiny facade of uh, Sochi. And uh, it details uh, the uh, conflicts, especially in the area of oops. <laughs> Abkhazia, about the, uh, the culture <coughs> of the area, about how uh, inhabitants were displaced in order to build the Olympic uh, uh, venue. So the basic metaphor behind the Sochi pro uh, project is the idea of the Potemkin village. You probably know that uh, Potemkin village is a village that was built when Catherine the Great took uh, a tour of uh, the countryside to see how the peasants were doing. Her lover and prime minister Potemkin built these facades of uh, villages, but they were nothing behind it. was like a movie set, and they were these happy, waving peasants. And it did have the fact that uh, really the, there was lots of discontent in, uh, in uh, provinces. So uh, the Sochi Project is a website. There are also some books, uh, photo books, that are available on Amazon. But um, on the website, you can access interviews, you can access pictures, you can access film. So it's a truly uh, transmedia project. Some people will say, because everything can be accessed from the website, it's not transmedia. Uh, because the transmedia, you have to use uh, different uh, delivery channels. If you think of something like uh, Harry Potter, you have to go to the movie house, you have to go to the toy store to buy a costume, you have to go to the bookstore to buy uh, <coughs> to buy the books. So you have to uh, find your information in various places where with the Sochi project everything is on the same website. So it, it depends on your definition of media. What is a medium? If it's uh, considered um, uh, mean of expression, then the Sochi project is to be transmedia because it has film, photo, text, etc. If uh, medium is a delivery channel, no, because uh, you have only one delivery channel and that is the internet. So I, I think that uh, transmedia works very well with real world stories. Uh, much better than with fictional stories because uh, in the case of fictional stories you always take advantage of uh, an independently <coughs> successful uh, story. It arises bottom up when in something like the Sochi project it, uh, it is planned top down. But uh, you could also, if it works with uh, real world, you could also work with fiction. As my last example, I'll show you a novel that is kind of uh, transmedia. Uh, does anybody know it? Uh, so it's called uh, Night Film, and it's, it's a typical multimodal uh, novel. In the sense that it uses lots of uh, replicas of imaginary documents. So you have text, but you have also pseudo websites, pseudo uh, uh, newspaper articles. So it's about. Uh, this young lady, Ashley Cordova, who was found dead uh, at the bottom of an elevator shaft, and it's not clear whether she committed suicide or whether she was murdered. And this is the author, Marisa Persley. You can see that there is a very strong resemblance between the two. And so the book is filled with multimodal documents. It's Cordova, her father, who hasn't been seen for uh, 30 years because her, his movies are so horrible that even uh, movie theaters won't show them. It's only shown in the underground. This is a picture submitted by a fan that the effect of watching a Cordova movie. So um, this is a multimodal text, and uh, not transmedia, because it's all contained within the pages of the book. But uh, there's more to uh, night film, is not a multimodal document. Uh, so there are some uh, symbols in the text, and if you download, uh, download an app and uh, 
you have a photo of my tablet computer. And you, you download the app and you, you bring it over that uh, symbol. <coughs> And suddenly it's trying to appear, and then you get addif additional information. So this information can be uh, visual, it can be textual, but it can also be audio. So it uh, belongs to media that cannot be contained in between the pages of the book. So this is really a multimodal, multi transmedia book, but in a very uh, a new way. What do the... Uh, um, Augmentation due to the story. I think it's a little bit disappointing. They expand the story more, but I don't. I think it's more exciting to download them. I, I felt the excitement when I suddenly saw my tablet filled with pictures, or I heard the heroine play the piano. It was a sense of magic. But I think that the augmentation are a little bit disappointing with respect to the plot. Um, the plot has a very ambiguous ending, and lots of uh, readers and another complain that it's not like the ending, and I think that the augmentation could not change to lift the uh, uh, ambiguity. No, I think we have this technology, uh, um, augmented reality, and, uh, but we don't really yet have stories that really profit from this augmented reality. So I think it's up to the novelist to find the plots that will really benefit. To conclude, um, <coughs> it may be true that when people love a story and its world, they will want more and more documents that add more uh, substance to the story world. And they want more and more objects that demonstrate their loyalty to the brand. This is a, an issue of marketing to collect. And um, this uh, principle is what inspires what I call bottom-up uh, transmedia projects, where people are already in love with the story world and they want more and more about it. But it's counterbalanced by another tendency. And that tendency is a uh, tendency to stick with the medium of a story world, if you really love the story world. Imagine that you are a fan of uh, uh, Mad Men, a TV series. What you want most is another episode of Mad Men. You wouldn't want a comic book about Mad Men. You wouldn't want a computer game. So people are really, uh, uh, they stick to the same uh, medium. <coughs> and I think that uh, works again, the uh, Transmedia storytelling. The uh, difficulty to justify distribution of narrative information over many delivery systems could explain why, as a media developer named Brian Clark has argued, there are no great transmedia hits. I mean, there are many great hits that became transmedia, but there are no great hits that started as a transmedia. This uh, failure to produce a great hit can be interpreted in two ways. According to one explanation, transmedia is not an autonomous mode of storytelling, it's rather a marketing strategy that force feeds story worlds to the public through as multiple, uh, as many media platforms as possible, in order to reach the widest possible audience. According to the other explanation, the failure to produce a mega hit means just that transmedia storytelling is an experimental project that still needs to find its true calling. And perhaps the criterion for success is not to produce a mega hit, but more modestly, a work that truly ju justifies its transmedia build-up. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Um, before we start the, the, the panel discussion, um, the organizers asked me to, uh, to tell you that we understand that many of you, or some of you, uh, have to leave, catch buses, uh, trains. This would be the time uh, to leave this before uh, we start the, uh, the panel discussion. Um, shall we bring out some chairs? Or? Yes, I think it would be good to just bring out some of these chairs. Yeah, so 
Okay, I think the last people that needed to go have gone. Um, thanks, all of you, so much. I think it was an incredibly inspiring evening, at least for me, to hear all those new perspectives and very different perspectives at times on, on roughly the same topics or at least the same kind of themes. There were three common threads, at least three common threads that I noticed that were going through some of the papers. Um, the idea of media that are moving, so the movement of media, movement of media into other media, the movement of media out of other media, perhaps the movement between media and the movement between media and what we call reality or whatever. So that was for me a kind of movement that I think we might come back to. The notion of worlding, of understanding particular spaces, of particular spaces created by media or particular media themselves as worlds, and the effect of the movement of media on the ontological nature of those worlds, whether it is through the paratexts of making of videos that become cues or, or hints or little games within a larger game, which of course really asks questions about the ontology of the game itself, of the game world itself, or whether it is the world um, of an interface that also may be seen as some kind of system or logic that works in its own right. And then finally, and I think this was really something that came up in different ways, the relations of those moving media, of those movements in media, and of those worldings that they then um, subsequently result in to the market. So the space of the market as a moment um, that keeps returning. I don't know if you have anything to add. And in this sense, I couldn't help but actually notice uh, that, um, that by the time we reached the end uh, of, uh, of your presentation, we basically made full circle. And to some degree, I think uh, Renee's uh, presentation about paratexts uh, somehow resonated uh, in the talk about transmedia. And I was wondering, just to start with the with the kind of first first uh, question, uh, if you would like to reflect uh, on on transmediality that we have just heard. Uh, through the lens of your interest in, uh, in paratext and, uh, and play. Do you see any resonance or do you see any connections uh, with the, uh, uh, the lecture that we just heard? Well, you know, if we consider making all media as paratextual, I think they might be seen as what you consider the marketing material, material around around the core uh, uh, media. It could also mean that if you have a transmedia storytelling world that could all, has, also has its like massive amount of paratext around that one as well. Um, nevertheless, I do think you can see traces of transmedia, or you can see traces of transmedia storytelling also in the paratextual, uh, paratextual surroundings. For instance, if you take the Matrix as an example, depending on which box set you bought. Some of them actually have the animatrix, which are the, 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 uh, the animes uh, uh, on there, as well as some of the comics. So going through this paratextual material actually provides some of the transmedia experience what the Wachowski set out to, set out to do. Um, I think it would actually be quite interesting to see more of this, that that is making of media or the, this paratextual material which is released alongside main text would have more story building instead of just, you know, yeah, well, marketing material showing how great the core text is. Well, I would say that uh, I would make the difference between paratext and transmedia. Um, paratext are often naturally transmedia. Uh, like uh, you can have, according to the net, you have the text uh, on the back box of a uh, computer game, that's a different medium. Or you could have an ad, uh, or you, a newspaper, or you could have, uh, yeah, you could even have a short film that uh, advert advertises a game. So, I think that uh, a text is very often transmedia, not, not necessarily because you have text. But I think that uh, transmedia should, uh, according to Jenkins, expand the, the world. So it's, it's fact that uh, part of the world where paratext is often uh, a comment uh, about. Yeah, about the world. And so in this sense, it would not be what 
that's called transiting asteroid. So I think that there is an overlap between mm -hmm. the two. So there's two different m movements of media moving in in this mm -hmm. sense. Um, to come to this, this, this idea of the world in, and I want to perhaps, Renato, have you answer this first, and then Michelle opens to remark on it. What happens to the world the moment, and this is for Renee, the moment the making of video moves into the world? And then for Michelle, what happens in your case with these very different kinds of devices when they move into the world? What happens to the world then? Do different things happen depending on the device, or is there a particular logic of different worlding that you have spotted in your research? So maybe Rene first and then Michel? So the question is... What, what happens to the world? What happens to the world the moment these making of video or these, these clues to the making of are drawn into the world? Oh, one thing which I find, find interesting, and this is maybe this is the slide which I kind of skipped, for instance, uh, about the audio commentaries in, in that, in that Half-Life 2, is where you see the, the audio commentaries moving into the world. Um, when, when you have an audio commentary in film, it usually is on top of Instead of the, gen the, the regular audio, you have now the audio commentary mm -hmm. you know, with the volume of your film tuned down so you can actually hear the director or the actors talk about, uh, talk about the film. Um, with, the, uh, with the games by uh, developer Valve, who made the Half-Life uh, games, what you see is that the audio commentaries are present as non-diegetic elements, like, like literally balloons you can you recognize from comics, right? Uh, were these next balloons floating within the world, asking your attention, uh, and therefore also maybe because of one of, you know, maybe the story element you're actually trying to pursue, or, or at least the game urges you to pursue it over there, you have this text balloon popping and bouncing up over there. So your gaze is actually drawn towards this floating audio commentary thing. So I think they, at least in that sense, as non-diegetic elements within the diegesis, within the, within the story world, they distract or at least add to the story world by being, well, something which shouldn't be there, but could be there. Um, so they create a kind of depth a different kind of depth of directionality to that world, within the world that we have, yes. an extra layer is added as it were. The origin is outside of the story world. Yes. Well, there are some cases, like you have a sports game, and you have an announcer, yeah. that this kind of people move, and I think this originates inside the story world. Mm -hmm. Because when you have a sports event, uh, when you have an announcer, so I think that a distinction should be made between the commentaries that are external to Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, you have you also, of course, a voice over uh, voice. You have you hear a voice of the main character talking, for instance. That's actually part of the story. Yeah, that's part of the story. Yeah, but an audio commentary, even even though it is actually visually present in the world, what you hear is actually separate from the world. Michel, um, I think. Um, yeah, I actually think these are examples of how uh, paratextual elements don't necessarily have to uh, um, include this, this switching between media and this experience of having to, um, uh, having to engage with the same fictional world through different channels. Um, and in the case of, of those audio commentaries embedded in the game's levels, you're still playing the game. Uh, but you're switching between narrative worlds or fictional worlds. You're switching between um, the world where you're uh, trying to escape this research facility or the military installation or whatever, uh, into this world where you're engaging with this meta-fiction about the people who made the game. Um, and there are other interesting examples that I could go into, but I, I think it's um, uh, important to Try and isolate this this um, uh, feeling of switching between um, either modes of engaging through the same media with different fictional worlds, or the way in which um, people experience themselves just switching channels, switching media to engage with the same fictional world. Um, uh, I think in, in some way when you um, watch those Matrix movies and then start reading the comics and the books and the whatever video games, um, you notice yourself switching.
switching different media to engage with the same fictional world and it kind of pulls this fictional world away from um, from the media of which it is told and that's one of the things that renders it more alive and able to engender all these different media objects that, that, um, that become portals to some kind of yeah, conceptual uh, conceptual world but not, not something that has to be embedded within, within a single core movie or single core book. Um, so yeah, this, this, this switching between the uh, switching between fictional worlds is interesting and um, interesting in that one one requires there to be different physical forms that you're engaging with and the others um, uh, more about how one physical form can contain more uh, uh, various different fictional worlds and stories. I don't know uh, if that's helpful to anyone. <laughs> if anyone has a question, but, uh, that's why what, what I take away from this. Uh, Maranka, how does it work for your world? You, just, you discussed uh, the, the aesthetics of the interface in this case, and you said that we should understand this interface as, an, as a world in its own, that this also has rules and laws. Um, is this a similar world to the game world, or is this a very different kind of world? Does it deconstruct itself? Does it add layers? How does it function? I think at times it can de deconstruct the world it creates, because at some points the metaphors it employs are, um, they lose their ground, so they don't really relate to the thing that they're metaphorically alluding to. Um, but I also think that um, software operates within a, and within a larger operating system. So in the sense, the operating system could perhaps be viewed as a meta-fictional world in which smaller fictional worlds of software programs are embedded. I don't know if that is a helpful. But so a kind of universe, perhaps. Yes, with different constellations which can consist in different arrangements and different times. Yes. Okay. Well, I think we're using the term world in a different sense. You use it in a metaphorical sense. I, d I do too, because I mean, uh, it's not a material world, but the fictional world has characters, it has time, it has space. Well, you, you world has time and space, uh, have the icons, characters. Uh. Well, I guess that the user is a character, like the main character, and it has a particular objective, because the user wants to create something within that world, and uh, it employs different materials to do so. In that sense, I think, um, like with gameplay, you have a kind of play within with the software tool, which is not a, a, a rigid narrative, but it is written down by, for example, the history panel. So, in a sense, yes, it's metaphorical, but I also think you could view it as a kind of temporary, ephemeral kind of story that we write ourselves. We could have also apply your analysis of Photoshop on the game engines that underlie the games, right? Uh, yeah, I guess so, yes. And one last question about sorry, one last question about worlds, which is for you, Michel, um, the second Michel, um, or the first, depending on you have to fight that out. One of the um, so these are all worlds that are part of the process, that are part of this moving of media. Whereas in your case, I guess worlds are very much at the end. That's right? either the world of the exhibition, the world of a particular art piece. And so um, we were speaking in the in the break, and Rene said, "Did the Congolese farmers actually get to get to eat um, uh, chocolate in the end?" Um, which you said, "Yes, I think half affirmatively, yes." So I'm wondering, what is the what is the fictional world? What is the projected world that is the outcome in this case of the project that you spoke about? Well, it's it's funny you say that because I was just of course also informed by the, the last talk, uh, looking at the issue of human activities as a, a transmedia, transmedial story, uh, because in this case, actually, the museum is not the end point. Uh, actually, it's very much at the start of things, because that's finally where these communities workers get their credits as artists. Uh, from there, the money starts flowing into Congo, and the gentrification starts. Um, although, and, and that is sort of also radically turning around the normal trajectory of things, because then museums are generally the end point of art. That's where it ends. And it's also been described as the sarcophagus mm. part, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I was actually also thinking, like, 
maybe there's also interesting examples within the art domain to look at in terms of transmedia storytelling. Because in this case, for instance, it's an open-ended story. We don't know where this will go. I know some of Renzo's plans, but even he can't predict what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So it's a world with an open ending. That's, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. But of course, there's also examples, especially in the world of design. If you look at design fiction, where the story is completely written up, but it's told through different media. So there's some objects that represent different parts of the stories. There's some research documentation. There's uh, sometimes also online components. So I think they make great examples to study. And perhaps also as a footnote uh, to this uh, question, you mentioned in your thought that. Um, this kind of binary of the flat, flat world model and the spiky model of, uh, of Florida. And you said that uh, you used to belong to a Florida camp, but now you're, you're kind of opening up for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you could say a bit uh, more about this confusion and why uh, you're feeling more and more confused um, as you're moving deeper into this project and thinking. Um, well, frankly, because when I started collaborating with the Institute of Human Activities, I also couldn't help feeling that it was a it was a useless exercise because it would never it would never actually result in uh, in better conditions for these plantation workers. While as I went along, also seeing how serious Renzo is about the project, and also actually some money flow sort of. Uh, starting up in, in their direction, I'm starting to think that, yeah, why not? Why, why can technology not make, make mm -hmm. things a little bit less unequal? So it was a very strong ethical um, component as well. Yeah. Then I guess this art project specifically um, does that by emphasizing how the world, world is this spiky construct where we get to eat the chocolate um, and we get to enjoy in some cruel way they're suffering and their um, uh, inability to make, um, uh, to participate in the art world, to um, make a decent living. Uh, we get to enjoy that by uh, con making this weird transmedial construct projected onto the real world um, uh, and, and rendering this, this story that we all get to participate in. Yeah. Um, and it is, I mean, the end point is probably some kind of democratization. And they, they will probably get, um, uh, get better living conditions over there, but um, it is built on this spiky world. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, I mean, the, the, the big question now, I guess, is is this a fictional project? Or not? Yeah. Uh, we don't know yet. We don't know what kind of spin all this could have yeah. and what it could cost. Okay. It's, it's maybe the same as for the, the journalistic projects. Um, you, you can, um, in some sense, just project these narratives onto real-world conditions and real-world uh, systems and situations and start connecting some dots and, and seeing where it leads uh, through these journalistic fictions or artistic fictions um, where you're constructing this system of um, uh, producing and reproducing and then selling statues and uh, transferring money back to uh, the original artist. Um, I mean, in that, in that sense, all of these models for uh, narrative analysis are um, maybe valuable because they could be projected onto real-world situations and uh, getting a grip on them and uh, explaining them in a certain way that can make Change in a certain way. Yeah. Well, maybe if I can do a follow up on, 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 on your remark uh, in the form of a question to, 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 to you, if I may, um, about the, um, uh, the, this notion about of, of transmedia storytelling as somewhat of a device journalists can also use, journalism can also use. And I was thinking while you were explaining this about agenda setting about framing uh, uh, and about things like propaganda which is all about storytelling mm -hmm. and you ended with we don't have famous examples or big hits when it comes to transmedia storytelling and, and I was thinking well you have Putin with the way he <laughs> <laughs> the 
uses all the various propaganda tools at his disposal and the media, the news, through the newspapers to, to, to tell a story. You have uh, Nazi Germany with him with, in terms of authorship uh, being top down and, and telling. So if you indeed see certain kinds of non-objective forms of journalism, usually propaganda-like, as a form of storytelling, these examples are you know, massively successful and might even be un unseen. We don't notice because they are all around us. They are so successful in their transmediality that we cannot even see that there are different voices also out there. So would you... Little girl, but it's article I mentioned Joseph Goebbels. Yes, right. right. Who uh, dominated TV, film, yeah. and the press. Yeah. And then he saw that they are so successful, but they're only negative ones. Yeah, but there's <laughs> ne nevertheless a big hit. A big hit. Yeah. <laughs> successful, at least, yeah. in whatever the goal was of that particular project. But it doesn't add to the interest no. of the story or the richness. But the story world is just a form of brainwashing. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And it might be a good platform to open up uh, the floor uh, for questions from the audience as well. I, I was impressed by the, the chocolate printing stuff. Uh, but, but, but I used to work at a department where the printing was developed. So that was nice. But the story behind it, you no, know, oh, it's a head of chocolate. But when you tell the story behind it, this actually went like this, and this is how it came to us. Then you look upon it as it, it becomes very special. So that is, I think, what people seem to intrigue. The story of the whole thing, how it connects together, is valuable. It's not just, this is 500 grams of chocolate, and I like chocolate. No, it's the whole story, how it went together. Yeah, these, uh, these chocolate hats would be a lot cheaper if they were sold in bars, I'm sure. <laughs> and what, what actually was added to it is, is are these emotions of the, of the plantation workers. And that's what makes them more valuable. So in principle, it's their story that they add to these, these chocolate. And that's what also makes them worth something more. And that's also what makes them earn a little bit more money out of this artistic labor than they did over the plantation. But the interesting thing is, but in, in medieval times, or Stone Age time, if a stranger came by from far away, you would, usually if he was not hostile, say, hey, this is a guy from far away. Maybe he has stories to tell. So if he could sing, if he could tell you marveling stories, you would give this person your precious food, shelter, in order to hear about what's going on there. People have always liked that. Even, even, uh, Cultures like Eskimo, for instance, the Inuit, had very scarce resource. Everything had to be used, otherwise they would perish. But still, they had stories, they had games, and, and, and this was important. Yeah, yeah, I think that's also what we're talking about tonight, the, the value of story. And we have time for one more question. We have to wrap it up very quickly. So, Hilbert, you're the last one. Yes, that's what I'm um, yeah, you mentioned how transmedia storytelling is, is um, uh, mostly a coordinated, swing-flying uh, uh, undertaking. And I was curious, what would, uh, you know, what would be the rules when it comes to from, uh, when uh, a top-down approach clashes with a bottom-up approach? But I was, uh, during your presentation, I was thinking about the uh, Star Wars Expanded Universe. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, that, that's, a, that's, that's a very, that's a, that's a, that's, that's, uh, an example, something that was built up from uh, initially from top down, mm -hmm. movies were made and uh, all kinds of merchandising, but around that whole you know, user generated fan fiction like uh, universe what was built up, and now they have to say, okay, well, that's all nice, great, but we have to cut it down in order to make sure that we have all the freedom we want to have uh, for the next three movies. So, um, is, is what's going on here, would you say? Yeah, that's the question of fan fiction, basically. Yes. And, uh, I mentioned there were three principles of, uh, of um, fan fiction. There is extension, there is uh, transposition, and there is uh, modification. Fan fiction uh, does all three. And 
that's what the Jorsukas company doesn't like. They don't want them to modify uh, the universe. They don't want it to, to transpose it. That's why so they try to have a very tight control over the file size. And so it has to be authorized by the Georgian Classic Company to be considered canonical. So that's the whole problem of canonical versus non-canonical. But I think that indeed every successful, uh, even if it's top down, will generate bottom up uh, transmediality or, I mean, fan fiction can be in the same medium. So um, I think that uh, fan fiction is a byproduct of uh, Transmedia, but it's not essentially, it's not part of the definition. And I, I think that's uh, why I disagree with Jenkins, because he has this concept of parti participatory culture, and he seems to say that transmedia is inherently participatory, and it, it can lead to participatory behavior, but uh, it's a side effect. <laughs> Yeah. All right, on that wonderful note, I want you all to join me in thanking the fantastic speakers and Malanka Michel and Helene for organizing this. I thank you all for the of food for thought and, and maybe some real, some real food. And <laughs> um, so let's, let's flee this incredibly hot sauna out of space and get some, some drinks.